who I'll introduce in more detail in a minute, and many of you already know her because she's a big supporter of Bren and you see her at events. We're really lucky that she's, um, she had this idea. She came to us with this very practical idea for a panel to help all of us, all the Bren students, um, learn about kind of the nuts and bolts of how a policy actually gets made, how it goes from the very beginning idea all the way through to implementation. Um, and as Deborah well knows from the graduates she's worked with um, and watched in their careers, our Bren students often end up changing the world. But making that change is really hard, right? It requires having that idea, figuring out what it would take to make the idea a reality, translating it into something that's actually policy, not just a pie in the sky idea, um, it requires getting others on board and navigating really complex politics often. Um, so we figured the best way to learn to do this is to dissect a real policy change. Something that's recent enough that the players remember what happened and to really get into the nitty gritty of what happened. <coughs> so the Santa Barbara City plastic bag stood out as one of these close and really relevant examples. Um, and we're fortunate to have panelists here who have um, absolutely firsthand knowledge of the sausage making, as it is. Um, and so we're really, we're really lucky to have them here. I should say we actually did try to get um, a representative from the grocery industry, um, but it turns out that their national or that their regional conference is this week, and they couldn't come, unfortunately. Um, but let me just quickly introduce our panelists and our facilitator, and then I will turn it over to them. So Helene Schneider um, was elected to her second term as Santa Barbara's mayor in November of 2013, so she should be a familiar face to many of you. She's served in City Hall since she was elected as a city council member in 2003. Um, she also represents Santa Barbara in kind of larger regional <coughs> issues, so in places like the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments, the Air Pollution Control District, uh, the Multi-Jurisdictional Solid Waste Task Force, Partners in Education. She's been president of the League of California Cities, Channel Counties Division. Um, and in the private sector, uh, Mayor Schneider is a human resources management consultant with HR Express. So she's also got that private uh, sector experience. And then um, Kathy King is here. Um, and she is the donor relations and ditch plastic program manager for the Community Environmental Council, which many of you also know about. Uh, she's founding partner of the Where's Your Bag campaign, and in 2011, she got the Looking Good Santa Barbara Spirit of Service Award from the city of Santa Barbara. Uh, she's also gotten the Honorary Service Award from the Montecito PTA, and um, works really hard with schools to do some green curriculum and, and uh, Earth Day school events. Um, she's been in this from the beginning as well, so she's really knowledgeable. Our panel facilitator today, who as I mentioned a lot of you know, is Deborah Schwartz. She's co-founder of Mesa Consulting and a member of the Bren Deans Council. She's, she's around here, we see her. Um, she's also serving in her sixth year as an appointed planning commission um, with the city, planning commissioner, excuse me, with the city of Santa Barbara. So actually making policy again. Um, prior to coming back here, she worked in the telecom industry. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah. She's going to introduce to us kind of the problem and the background a little bit, and then um, we'll turn it over to our panelists. We really want to leave enough time for people in the audience to ask a lot of questions to have a conversation about this, so we will try and stop with plenty of time for questions. So as you're listening, think about the things that you want to know, and think about also the ways that, the questions that you might want to ask that help you think about how this generalizes to other policies that you might be interested in, other changes that you might be interested in, questions that would help you understand how to take this example and turn it into something you can actually do. Thank you so much, Professor Anderson. Excuse me, I'm just getting over laryngitis. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I just want to take a couple of minutes and set the stage for our two panelists. Uh, to speak with you, and again, as uh, uh, Professor Anderson said, we want it to be very interactive today. Uh, the story of the single-use plastic bag ban in the city of Santa Barbara really starts back in 2007 with a student by the name of Kathy King uh, at Santa Barbara City College uh, 
and some of her fellow students uh, presented to the Santa Barbara City Council actually in May of that year, 2007, and the council directed the city planning staff to meet with the then Solid Waste Committee to discuss the possibility of a law restricting the use of plastic bags and styrofoam food containers. Now, as Kathy uh, continued to pursue the law uh, path beyond the Santa Barbara City College class, she connected with very important, diverse stakeholder organizations that I want to identify for you, and our panelists may speak to this a bit more shortly. The Community Environmental Council, where Kathy currently works, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, a nonprofit in our area, and that was a key partner, California Grocers Association, Surf Rider Foundation, the Environmental Defense Center, Save the Mermaids, and Washington Elementary School. Now lastly, uh, there was a collaboration, a consortium, under the acronym BEACON, and BEACON stands for Beach Erosion Authority for Clean Oceans and Nourishment, BEACON. The member agencies of BEACON who were prominent in um, the support, ultimately, of the enactment of this ban include the following cities and counties. Cities of Oxnard, Port Wyneme, Ventura, Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, and Goleta, the County of Santa Barbara, and the County of Ventura. Now, the environmental impact report that was to be required was going to cost approximately $60,000 per municipality. And that's rather steep for some of the smaller municipalities. So the city of Santa Barbara was really very central, and Mayor Schneider will talk more about this, in creating the model ordinance. And then with other municipalities that I've just mentioned, each paying their proportional fair share of the EIR, uh, a resolution was passed supporting the EIR in September of 2011. Uh, to wrap up, along the way, there was certainly some opposition by elected officials. Mayor Schneider and I remember that well. And legal challenges. Key to the ultimate uh, enactment of the ban, though, was something that's often referred to in political campaign strategy language as winning the hearts and minds. And I'm sure you'll be... Uh, exposed to this if you've not already worked on various political campaigns. Supporters in all three sectors, that is a uh, nonprofit, public, uh, and private, were all engaged and supportive. And we really all had to strive for the perfect not getting in the way of the good or as good as it gets, um, as, as the case may be. Uh, so to conclude, um, in the end, our panelists will describe how the single-use plastic bag ban in the city of Santa Barbara was a model case for applying factual environmental data to a real-world current environmental problem in order to promote a solution through new public policy enactment. And I can't think of a better group to discuss this with uh, than you here at Bren. So I'd like to turn it over first to Ms. King uh, then we'll take a quick break and allow you to ask two to three questions of Ms. King, and then we'll move on to Mayor Schneider. Thank you very much, Ms. King. Okay, thank you. Just on. Um, so I was a reentry student at San Barbara City College in 05, 06, 07, and a class that I was taking in the spring of 07 was a workshops and sustainability class. So we had to come up with a group project. And so we all took turns going to the board and writing, you know, this is a group project I'd like to pursue. Um, and I had lived in Santa Monica before moving to Santa Barbara in 98, and they had a styrofoam ban, um, and there had been talk of, of getting rid of, of plastic ban, and, and it was just the beginning of people realizing that single-use plastics, which is a, you know, materials made out of fossil fuels to use and toss, wasn't turning out to be such a good idea, even though it was very convenient and people were adapting to it really quickly, um, the impacts were starting to show themselves. And San Francisco passed a single-use bag law in 2007, and they were the first, of course, in California to do that. So, um, you know, with my piece of chalk, I wrote that on the board at City College, and that was one of the chosen projects, and so I worked with a few other students. 
Um, and the nice thing about living in a smallish city is accessibility to government. Um, I emailed the mayor, and within a day, that day, I had a response. It was, um, mayor was a woman named Marty Bloom at the time. Had a response back and said, this is what you need to do to get on a city council agenda. So it was, it was really nice to have that, you know, immediate response and accessibility. I don't think you get that in a, in a larger city. Um, and we were on our way. And it, <laughs> this was the beginning of school, um, and we ended up presenting before city council during finals week. So that's how long it took. <laughs> to get on an agenda. It's still, even though you have this access and you figure out what you need to do, we had to write a letter. We had to, we went and met with Doss Williams, um, who was on the city council at that time. He's a member of the state legislature now. Um, and he was the most, uh, and a Brent School graduate. Uh, <laughs> he was the most pro-enviro member of the city council, so we went and met with him and got his buy-in um, before we went and did the presentation. And the presentation led to council directing staff. At that point, no one was willing to jump in and be second after San Francisco. It was really kind of too soon. Um, the momentum had not yet built for um, these types of laws. And so um, we did get direction, the council directed staff to look into it, and, and staff spent a significant amount of time on a report, um, which was nice. It was, you know, we were hoping that they'd all go, yeah, let's do this right now. And, you know, you, you don't get that right away very often. Um, so um, then I, you know, was done with City College because um, all I wanted to do was take all their environmental classes because I was looking for a job in the field. Um, and after the class was over, I was still interested in doing this, and I got contacted by a couple of people who were had seen the presentation and said, "Look, we want to, we want to continue working on this and make this happen." And they connected me with the executive director of Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, and that really got the partnership that was the lead, ended up being the leadership of, of our coalition underway. Um, and so we went back to council in 2008, stronger with, with more players, um, including the California Grocers Association. And I'm sorry they can't be here today because they were really key, because they were behind it. Um, it worked for them. They wanted to see this happen, um, and, um, and they, were, they were in favor of it, which made all the difference in terms of getting business buy-in. Um, and so um, we got them, and we went back to council, and again, council wasn't quite ready for it. Um, and so we got a, uh, they said, go do some education. Go do education outreach. Everybody loves education programs. So um, we got a budget, and we got to use city staff, and between our three groups with, by then I was working at Community Environmental Council, and they were kind of like, mm, plastic, not so sure, but okay, go ahead and do it. It wasn't really in the fossil fuel category, even though CEC was about transitioning the region away from fossil fuels. Um, plastic hadn't really gotten that kind of attention at that point. But I felt the reason that I was passionate about it and wanted to do it was because I saw this as a starting point. Everybody buys food. So if you're going to try to connect people to environmental issues, why not start with something that everybody touches every single day and say, hey, make this simple habit change. If you can do this, then we can move forward and maybe, you know, do the larger things. But this was a way to get people at, you know, at, at the very most basic level. Um, and so we did the education program. We called it Where's Your Bag. We came up with a logo. We did a really splashy um, kickoff event that was great. We went to grocery stores and asked them to put up signage. And we had the city seal on all of our materials, which was huge because, you know, when you have the city behind you, that's meaningful to the businesses. Um, and we did outreach. We at, we did tabling events, we gave away bags, we talked to a lot of people. Um, but we knew that we weren't going to educate our way out of 47 million plastic bags being distributed just in the city of Santa Barbara every year. So we kept at it. Um, and the city council, there's elections, things change. We went from having four to three favorable to four to three probably not favorable in terms of the vote of the seven people on the council. Um, so. At one point, Grant House, who was on Beacon, which is the other the um, beach erosion board, um, said, I think Beacon could play a role here. Because by then, there had been some enough studies done to show the plastic impacts in the ocean, to show that plastic bags on beaches were having an impact. So he said, I think Beacon can you know, find a way to be involved in this as a beach issue. And so that's how the idea of doing the EIR through Beacon was born. Because you know, one thing you don't want to do as an activist is put pressure on a city's budget. And an EIR that costs 60 grand for this type of ordinance seemed hefty. It made me feel bad. I didn't want 
the city of Santa Barbara to spend that kind of money. So, ha and then we'd had some pushback from some of the conservative council members saying, well, why don't we do this regionally? Why isn't the state doing anything? Well, the state had tried at that point already once and failed. Um, and so, um, involving Beacon was really a turning point because it meant that we could address the regional issue with the council members who were less than in favor of this. And also, it was just going to be cheaper. Every Beacon member could access that EIR. And so we had about $8,000 donations from several of the agencies. We got a couple of foundations to donate, um, and then we did the EIR. Um, do you want me to keep going all the way through to the end, or should we? <laughs> should I let Helene talk? <laughs> it's a long story. <laughs> it certainly is. Longer long than it should winding. be. <laughs> uh, why don't we just uh, pause for a moment, Ms. King, and see if there are any questions, two, two or three questions from any of the students. Um, otherwise, we could go to Mayor Schneider, but. We don't want to rush through this in any way. And I still know some of you are very passionate about uh, this type of thing and, and um, adverse impacts to, to the marine environment. Yes, please. Um, they saw it coming, I think, and they wanted to have a voice in it. They wanted it to be um, uniform, so they were looking for if they were going to support a law, they wanted it to be the same law everywhere. I mean, they were definitely more in favor of a state law, but lacking that. Um, and they also wanted the, um, the type of law that we were pushing for, which was the ban on plastic be on paper, because they want tourists to be able to shop in their stores. They want unplanned purchases to be covered by being able to purchase a paper bag if you didn't bring your own bags. Um, and. Uh, um, I, know, I can look up their letter and tell you more, but they were definitely um, I, they were definitely in favor of it, and it was a good thing for us. Up, up top. Yes, please. I don't. It was pulled from the waste. Uh, we, the city. It's my mind. Yeah, uh, the city solid waste department um, has as part of its budget, a lot of educational and outreach and um, push towards recycling. And so part of that budget had to do with purchasing the reusable bags, doing a lot of the uh, marketing, which they do anyway. They just incorporated this as part of their regular marketing as, a, as part of their reduce, reuse, recycle programs. And this was just added on to that. Yes. Professor Anderson, please. <laughs> I'll add that, sure. Any other questions right now for Ms. King? We certainly will, yes, please. We'll have more time um, before we conclude also, please. Uh, what did they say saying not words for good outcomes? Um, lobbying. <laughs> the plastic <laughs> lobby put in huge money into the state Senate as it was going through the state Senate process and it failed by, I think, three votes, uh, more than one. And then I even think, did Schwarzenegger veto it one year? Mm -mm, no. no, he was behind. He it. was behind it the whole time, right? Right. But it was it was lobbying at the state senate level. Okay, so I think right now we'll turn it over to our next panelist, Mayor Schneider, and uh, then we'll, again we'll come back to you uh, for much more uh, interactive discussion. Thank and, you, Mayor and Schneider. And thanks. And and just to follow up on that too, I mean, I think um, the 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 one of the counter arguments had to do with jobs. Anytime there's an environmental issue that's controversial, right, it seems like the other side has to do with jobs. And so that's why having the California Grocers Association as a key stakeholder was really very important because obviously they care about the economy and jobs too. And, and part of, I think, the lessons learned has to do with um, you can't just sing the tune to your own players. You need to sing a harmony. And you know there might be different reasons why someone or a group of people approve or uh, will approve something that may be different than your motivation. But you need you know the chorus there to, um, for whatever reason, they're interested in the in the policy to move forward and give all you know a bunch of reasons why it's a good thing for whatever their interests are. So uh, I I wrote down I had six lessons learned through this, and um, the first is. Persistence is essential. Um, Kathy was talking about this started in 2007, and, and I was already on the city council then. And 
you know, it, it, again, and as, as was mentioned, this was kind of a new thing, although countries were passing plastic bag bans. I mean, you'd think, you know, and they, and they weren't uh, going under, and there, there weren't like long unemployment lines or things like that. Uh, and so you had to get this momentum going, and the, and the persistence piece is essential because there were, there, were, there were trial and errors in terms of going through a process to get to the ultimate goal, but if, if it wasn't for Channel Keeper, CEC, Kathy in particular, I have to say, she was sort of my uh, go-to person whenever I get some wacky letter from someone about, you know, how banning plastic bags would be the end of time in the world as we know it. I'd send it to Kathy and she'd give me some good talking points back and things like that. Um, the Washington school, elementary school, uh, fourth graders start sending letters to council members, you know, in those big papers with, you know, they're practicing their penmanship, you know, and you get 30 or 40 of them from fourth graders saying, don't kill the turtles, ban plastic bags. I mean, it's kind of hard to counter that. You know, and and uh, they come to city council meetings and the whole group was there as part of a class assignment. And, you know, and there, I think those fourth graders are now, maybe you're in the room now for all I know. <laughs> really? um, but that was, you know, so that persistence and you needed that coalition just to keep pushing it and keep pushing it. And the council members who were on the council, whether they were ending their term or a new person coming on, you know, needed to, to keep that momentum going. Uh, the, the second lesson is don't let the perfect get in the way of the good, as, as uh, Deborah mentioned and Kathy as well. So this one push when our council flipped from a 4-3 ma majority and didn't get the work done in time, because frankly we, we were looking at the state at that point. We're saying, well, if there's going to be a statewide law, it's going through the process, it passed the assembly, we think this is going to be statewide, why don't we just, it's ideal that this becomes a state ban and not just a patchwork of different ordinances throughout the state. So. That ended up being, well, a little too late for us because by the time then it got, when it, when it failed in the state, our council through an election switched to 4-3 uh, or 4-3 you know, the other direction. Um, so I was happy to become mayor, but, uh, uh, but I also inherited a much more conservative council when I went from council member to mayor. And there was just no interest at that point to move forward with it. So this idea of the where's your bag campaign and the educational piece was something um, and it, you know, and I voted for it. I wasn't very happy voting for it, but I think there's even a, a local article that said, well, it's better than nothing, you know. And it, had we just said, forget about it, the persistence, the momentum would have been gone. We wouldn't have had the, you know, constant reminder about where's your bag and getting um, some data together, uh, because leading to the next, uh, the next thought was voting counts and elections matter. You know, this became a campaign issue. Uh, city councils have elections every two years and how we're going to do that now in the city is going to change dramatically. That's a whole other conversation. But um, at this point, you know, we had three seats and three, you know, a bunch of ten, ten candidates coming up and the single use bag ban was an election item at, at forums and uh, interviews. I mean, you name it. And so you got a sense of where people were and that really mattered to voters. And getting people out on that as an issue was very important. Um, so. So that, you know, but you needed to keep that momentum going. The, the other thing is to know the code. And I see this on a lot of issues when it comes to elected, uh, elected officials saying, well, we should wait for this or wait until that or let's see until this certain something happens. A lot of times delay equals opposition. And they don't want to necessarily say to the fourth graders who are saying, please don't kill the turtles. You know, I don't believe in what you're saying. Um, some councils actually will, though, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, <laughs> and, but, you know, they'll say, well, this isn't very prudent. It's probably more efficient if we look at, you know, and let's just wait until this or wait until that. And really, to me, that's just a way of, of just delaying the, the inevitability. Now, I, I have to admit, I've done that on other things I don't like either. I'm saying, well, I don't like this project. Let's see what else can happen or, or something. But, you know, that is something to keep in tune of and, and not just say, you know, what are, what are you really trying to get at here? Um, so just sometimes delay equals opposition. Um, the next step, and the fifth thought was keep your eyes on the prize. I mean, that persistence piece is really important, but what, what's your ultimate goal? And where are you trying to get to and how are you going to get to it? And this is where the coalition was really very helpful. Uh, we had a council member still on the council who, uh, as part of the ordinance committee, he, he was, it was presented about how uh, turtles and marine mammal life can see plastic bags in the water and they think it's something to eat and they ingest it and it gets caught up in their intestines and so forth. And, and this council member basically said, well, you know, they, they can just digest it. It's not a big issue. What, you know, this is, this is false information. 
Um, that became, you know, a big issue, and uh, we had the Save the Mermaids as this very, um, if we had more time and thought about it, I think, and more time today, would have shown the video of the Save the Mermaids in their outfit, bringing together these homemade plastic sandwiches and offering it to the council member. Um, you know, having that levity there was important, but it, it served a purpose, right? Uh, saying, well, would you like to have a plastic sandwich? Be careful, they're a little chewy. I mean, I think that was the comment. Uh, you know, and just to really to keep keep the eyes on the prize of where we're trying to get to. And, and then um, calling their bluff. And really, this is where Beacon came in. So Beacon is a joint powers authority, and you uh, one member from each of these jurisdictions represents their jurisdiction at Beacon. And Beacon mostly looks at all the policies related to moving sand around, pretty much. Uh, you know, so you have dredging, and you have um, and, and beach erosion and nourishment and things like that. But it's basically ocean protection and nourishment. And so it fit within their purview. And I have to say, Council Member Grant House, who is our city's representative, was very innovative in thinking that this matched their mission. It helped that the staff person in charge of Beacon was also a member of the Ventura City Council who cared about the issue, who also happened to work for a Ventura County Supervisor who was the representative on Beacon. I mean, these connections, you know, make, make sense. And normally, a lot of times, the member of Beacon is someone who's already interested in environmental issues. That's why they want to take the time to serve on Beacon. So, so even though each individual city council or board of supervisors might have had a mix philosophical, you know, on their philosophies on their politics, the members of Beacon were unified in saying this is important, even though, you know, and so having this idea of everyone's talking about this and saying, well, what if Beacon was the kind of the hub here, and having council member House saying, you know what, we'll do, the city of Santa Barbara, we will do the model ordinance. Hello, Skype. Okay. Um, so, you know, we'll do the model ordinance and, and do the work in-house within Santa Barbara, give it to Beacon, and then have them do the environmental impact report. And so, again, as was mentioned, the EIR cost was then proportionately shared. So instead of 60000 we paid, I think the city paid eight. Uh, made a big difference. And I think actually the Orfila Foundation came in. So we had a, now we had a foundation who was really interested in this, actually willing to pay for the cost. So you calling their bluff, be, what I say about that is we had a council member who was like, well, using the delay equals opposition um, scenario saying, the state's about to do this again. We, you know, this isn't good just to have one city do it. It should be at least a regional thing. And we're like, all right, you want a regional policy? We're going to make one. And this is how Beacon came in and let's just do it. And, like, and, and he actually then had to vote for it because it was his idea, right, even though he was really trying to, I, and I believe, trying to derail the whole project. Um, so sometimes calling your bluff and, and making it work to your advantage is really quite important. Um, there was one other thing, and then I, I want to make sure we opened it up. But, oh, this meaning, um, this, the story really isn't over. So the city of Santa Barbara does have a pl uh, single-use plastic bag ban in place. It's about a year old. I mean, it's amazing it took eight years, right, to have a full year implementation from the idea back in 20, 2007. Uh, it went through Beacon, the EIR process happened, but the County of Santa Barbara doesn't have a bag ban, the City of Goleta doesn't have a bag ban, the City of Ventura, the County of Ventura, Port Wyneme, I mean, they don't. And the idea was you had this EIR that then it was up to each jurisdiction to actually adopt it. <coughs> and um, I know at least for the County and for the City of Goleta, their rationale was, well, the state, we're about to pass a bill which actually did pass, and the governor did sign it, and they're like, oh, well, then things are fine. But now that, as you may know, has been um, challenged, and there's going to be uh, an initiative, right, on next year's ballot. So they're just like, well, we'll just wait to see what happens. Again, I kind of wonder, are we really just waiting and seeing, or is this just an easy way out um, if you don't really want to implement something like this? So uh, the, the story's not done yet. I'm just happy that the city of Santa Barbara finally, finally got through it, and uh, that was... That was, it. and, and I, I have to say, I have not received one email in a year from someone complaining that they could not get a single-use plastic bag at Albertsons or Vons or wherever. Um, it, you know, it's really just a non-issue once it's implemented. So, I didn't even mention lawsuits and stuff. There's a, there's a whole, <laughs> it, it was a complicated It's issue. very long, it was very, yeah, very long, very complicated. And, and I think also the, the chemistry industry uh, the American Chemistry Council, which oversees this, they started a group called Save the Plastic Bag Coalition. Um, you know, it's very similar tactics. 
um, that you see in all industries, what Alec is doing or other other groups. You know, it's it's on a different, on a small, maybe a smaller scale, but they're just they're trying to protect their interests, um, and they come out in full force. And and one of the things that we worked on when crafting the the, the model ordinance for the EIR that then became the city law was defensibility which is something that had never occurred to me. I'm like, yeah, let's just go do this. No, it has to be defensible. The city attorney is sitting there going, well, if you don't do this, you know, so we had to come up with, the, you know, there have to be exemptions. So, but, I, but one thing I want to make sure that everybody knows is so the, the city was distributing 47 million plastic bags every year. With the law in place, it's gone down to under 5 million. And when people say, I need them for secondary uses, I need them to line my trash cans, I need them to pick up after my pets. Well, still, 5 million bags in distribution every year for a city of 100,000 should be enough to take care of that. <laughs> but that's, that's some of the, that, that were some of the arguments that we got. Something else I wanted to point out was when you have a coalition like this, we had Environmental Defense Center, we had Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, we had Save the Mermaids, we had Surf Rider, um, we had these school groups, we had so many people, and, and you go to these council meetings and you, you get up there and you get to say your piece for two minutes and you, you list all these things, we're giving out billions of bags, we've got to stop this. What we realized a little ways into the process after doing this a few times was that we're all getting up there and basically saying the same thing, different versions of it, but basically the same thing. And I'm sitting there watching the council's eyes glaze over. And I think my eyes would glaze over too if I'm hearing you know, five or six people marching up there saying the same thing. So one idea that we came up with, which I think is useful and applicable in other situations that are similar, is, is to um, divide up the talking points. So we'd have EDC hit Environmental Defense Center, you hit the legal issues here. Who's being sued? How are they getting out of it? How is that working? You know, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper hit the ocean impacts um, talking point. So when, once we did that, I think it was, it was definitely helpful for all of us in terms of being able to drill down to some finer points and come up with new information each time um, because there was so much emerging information happening at that time with all of the um, research that was being done. But it also, I think, um, ended up making us stronger as a group and making us our case better. And watch the lobbying next year from the bag the ban people as opposed to ban the bag people. I mean, it, it's going to get expensive when, it, when a statewide ordinance happens. Um, so let's do this. We'd like to use the remaining time for really an interactive discussion, questions and comments. Also comments, not just your questions. So any thoughts? that are coming up, please, yes. Right, no, excellent question because I think, and Kathy can speak from the outside focusing in to policymakers, I can focus from being on the inside trying to get something accomplished, right? Um, you know, ideally there are many people who just say, well, why are we even allowing a 10 cent per paper bag because of all the energy used to create the paper? And, you know, I mean, it's not, that's not, you know, the most environmental solution either. Why don't we just ban everything? And, and, and then what, whatever happened to the styrofoam containers and whatever happened to the, you know, and, and so all these other things come up. And that's why I was saying keep your eyes on the prize was really important because we wanted to get something. And if we tried to accommodate everything, we'd get nothing. And it's sometimes a hard choice to make. And, and you can think of a lot of different policy issues. Um, I don't like the word compromise because it sounds like you're giving up a value and you're not. You're trying to actually promote and move forward and, and get something accomplished. But you need to be strategic in how it works. Uh, lots of different policies can happen that way. And knowing your audience, and, and you know, by the time the the ordinance came to council, we got a unanimous vote, right? Did we get? Yeah, yes, we did. I think we did. I mean, at that point, we wore down the opposition so much, you know, there was just like whatever, um, okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, it bec and also because every argument on that particular piece was was, you know, just argued to ad nauseum. I think if we kept trying to expand every time it came to council, we still would be arguing about. It as opposed to accomplishing something. So it's, it's a judgment call, it's a strategic call, it's hard to do, yeah. Oh, okay, it's for the recording. Um, yeah, I have mostly have a question for Kathy. You mentioned uh, sort of why plastic bags and this being a place to start for people um, in their sort of 
broader environmental activism potentially, and I'm, I'm wondering what your experience with that has been. Uh, I mean, not just your personal experience starting a plastic bags and now working for CEC, but your experience talking to other people uh, since the plastic bag ban. Is, you know, have you experienced that at all? Like, is there any evidence that that has occurred? Uh, I think it's a really good question. Maybe the jury's still out since it's only been in effect in, in Santa Barbara for a year. Um, I think the nice thing is that, like the mayor said, there haven't been complaints. And the people that I talked to about it, because, you know, I did get somewhat of a reputation at times um, and took some heat from people. Um, but I think it, it, it has it has played out that, yeah, this is just a simple habit change, and oh, and, I, and it's not that hard. And I get people coming up to me saying, gosh, that was the easiest thing. I, don't, I, I keep them in my trunk. I, get, I have to stop and listen to people tell me their stories. Well, first I was keeping them in my trunk, and now I keep them in the back seat. So, uh, you know, I think, <laughs> or I forget them, and then I just load everything in the car. You know, you get, you get all these different ways that people are coping with it, but they all seem pretty happy about it. Um, I don't know in the large, to the, the larger point that uh, is this making more people environmentalists? Um, you know, I still hope so, but I don't have any you know, data to speak to that. I'm not familiar with how the. I'm not familiar with how uh, an ordinance like this would be enforced on a smaller scale with like individual independent convenience stores that are affected, or smaller grocery stores, drugstores, pharmacies. Um, is there some sort of met method in place where the people who are following the plastic bag ban are? recognized and the people who aren't are perhaps helped to understand that this is a, an ordinance now? So a big portion of implementing the ordinance was education and reaching out to uh, businesses to say it was coming. I mean, there was actually a six month delay to let the big guys uh, comply and then a whole nother six months for the smaller mom and pop convenience stores type to comply. and. And so before things were enacted or they had to comply with the ordinance, our solid waste um, environmental services staff did a lot, a lot, a lot of conversation and outreach. Plus there was just a lot of PR about it and so forth. Uh, so, so there was education up front. Most ordinances in the city anyway are enforceable by um, complaint and, and by auditing. Sometimes, you know, if someone comes in and they say, you gave me a plastic bag and you know and they report it to the city then we then follow up on that uh, it, it doesn't help an organization a business to purchase plastic bags if I mean they, that's a that's a cost to them that they know they're not going to be able to use if caught and I think you know people are going to realize that's the case if if, if uh, if someone goes into a store and they get a plastic bag. Now, you know, you can still use plastic bags for takeout hot food and restaurants and things like that. There are exceptions out there. Uh, but I think the, and I think what's, what's been going on is the, the PR behind it and the good nature, the, you know, it, it, it hasn't really been an issue to folks to make it a big deal. Plus, they do have the option of having paper bags that the 10 cents go back to them. I mean, that was part of the whole issue state law, there's a whole conversation about why that worked the way it worked, and that was part of why the Grocers Association was in support of this particular ordinance, because it did even give the um, any store an opportunity to not be, um, not have a financial hit through it, through this ordinance. So, you know, I, but technically it's not like there's a fairy godmother out there checking, um, but it is enforceable in the sense that there's, there's a complaint, we will, we will follow up. And it seems like what I've seen has been almost the opposite. Like I was buying something at Sports Authority here in Goleta um, once, the, and I think it had only been since the, it, the large stores had been affected or were about to be affected, and the girl asked me if I wanted a bag. I'm like, no, of course not. I have a bag here. Um, 
I'll put, put stuff in my own bag. And she's like, well, good. I'm glad you have that because, you know, we, are, we do have a law coming and we're not going to be able to give these out anymore. Well, number one, they're not in the city of Santa Barbara. Number two, they're a retailer, not a grocer. But I was like, you know what? If you want to think that, then that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and again, countries have done this, you know, and, and states have done this. California should do this. It's really... Uh, it's not rocket science, you know. There, there are ways around it. I've been, I have cats, and so um, getting rid of some kitty litter, I've become very resourceful in every little bag of like whatever I have. It's like, oh, I reused that. I, I have this, you know, from something else. I'm going to keep it over here. I mean, you know, you just you, and you think about reusing things and being more efficient with with your materials. I mean, it's really. in general, um, and the materials that we use were generated by a lot of groups like NRDC or whoever, and in general, the, um, the argument is about the impacts on the disposal side um, because of the, the tendency, you know, and, and then, you know, then you get the argument, oh, well, we just throw ours away. But the problem with these types of items is that even if they're thrown away properly, they fly out of trash cans or trucks really easily because of their light weight, and that's how they end up in creeks and storm drains and then in the ocean. So that, that and also the, there is the heartstrings piece of, you know, seeing pictures of birds with plastic bags wrapped around them or a sea turtle about to take a bite out of a floating one. Um, so, yeah, definitely it was more on the disposal side than the manufacturer side. But, the, I mean, the manufacturer argument is, is pretty simple in the sense that, okay, here's a product being made that we use for basically five to ten minutes out of fossil fuels. Um, so that's sort of all I feel like I need to say on that end. And, and in terms of manufacturing in California, with all these arguments about job loss, I think there's about 200 jobs in California that are focused on plastic bag manufacturing. Well, and, and I think another argument that did come up is plastics are, it's a valuable commodity. And why are we wasting something so valuable on a single-use plastic bag? We need it for medical equipment. We need it for, I mean, for, pick your, you know, I mean, think about how many times you use, I mean, look at the plastic in this room, I mean, you know, in terms of, of uh, just materials. And why are we wasting it on something that we're just going to use for five minutes and throw away as opposed, you know, when it's a finite source, really? Um, and we're going to use it for clothes, I guess, in Patagonia or something, right? I mean, that would be that, and that resonated with some folks. So I actually have a question more about the, I guess, recycling side of it. Coming from out of state, where recycling plastic bags is definitely not a thing. I, it just seems to me like it took me a really long time being here to even know that that was an option. So I was kind of wondering where you see the education in that side, because especially with Goleta so close to Santa Barbara. I'm sure a lot of people do their shopping in Goleta, and then they end up in Santa Barbara with tons of plastic bags. And so, I mean, where do you see kind of the education side of that? Because I haven't really seen any education campaigns telling me that I can recycle this, and I've been confused multiple times if I actually can recycle it. Right. And it depends on where you can recycle single-use plastic bags. Um, different jurisdictions focus on if how their contract works with their hauler and, and their recycling contracts. And uh, it's a, you know, getting the, I get confused too when I'm having like, okay, this is compostable and this is recyclable and, and this one is a can with food in it, do I have to wash it? Or, you know, it, it's a constant thing. And I think um, I don't have a good answer for that except to say to keep on pushing the inform correct information out as much as we can in, you know, with signage on the cans, with constant PSAs, with, you know, um, ideally you have, this is why it is ideal to have a statewide policy so you don't have different jurisdictions with different rules because it just gets so confusing. Why even have a plastic bag that you can get in Goleta that you're going to bring home to Santa Barbara? Why not just say you just don't have any plastic bags? 
Um, to add to that, um, it also depends on how you define recycling. Um, if you put a piece of glass or a piece of paper or an aluminum can or a metal can into a recycling bin, you can be pretty assured that that is going to get made back into that item again, pretty much infinitely. Plastic does not fit into that category. Plastic bags do not get made back into plastic bags. They want virgin material. There's too many different types of plastic. A water bottle does not get made back into a water bottle. Most of the time it gets downcycled. Um, it's not a commodity that people who do recycling want to buy. A lot of, um, for a long time, we have so many shipping containers that come over here from China and go back empty. Um, for a long time, our plastic was going in those empty containers because they were taking it and just picking through and seeing what was usable. They don't even want it anymore because now they've got their own plastic issues. Um, and so we had one of our surf rider partners went to the transfer station in Ventura to see what was happening with the plastics there, and it gets all bailed up depending on what kind it is. The plastic bottles will end up in these huge bales in these big piles, and it was getting offshore to Nicaragua. Um, and, they, and they go to places where they do not have CEQA and they do not have the same environmental um, regulations that we have here, and they'll get buried on a beach or they'll get incinerated. Um, and so that's, it's a really good question, and to me, plastic does not fit. When I go talk to kids at schools about this, I say, this is not recycling to me. This does not meet the definition of recycling, which is the chasing arrows in a continuous circle of turning something back into itself again. So. You know, we, we tried to stay away from that when we were talking about this. I mean, at, I think the recycling rate of plastics in California is like 5%. Um, but to me, it doesn't even really matter because where is that 5% going anyway? Um, so you mentioned some of the delay tactics and resistance of different jurisdictions like the city of Goleta and adopting, adopting this, and that maybe they're just waiting to see what the state does. But what is really their motivation for not wanting to adopt this after the city of Santa Barbara has? What's I think that? you need to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know. Actually, they were teed up. We, we, we were waiting. We kind of waited to get Santa Barbara done, one and done, so that we could go to these other jurisdictions and go, OK, it's, we've done it here. You need to be next. We have the EIR. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be great. We had, this time last year, we had the county ready to go. We had Goleta ready to go. Even the city of Ventura had voted to be ready to go. Um, and then there became a ticking clock with uh, SB 270, which was the state law, that there was going to be a grandfather clause that was going to expire on September 1st. So if they didn't um, pass it by September 1st of 2014, then they were going to be superseded by the state. And then it's like, well, why do it anyway? Why have your own law if you're going to get taken over by whatever happens at the state level? So we ended up with this ticking clock going, OK, well, and then it looked really good. This time last year, it was like, wow, this is really going to happen at the state level this time. Third time's the charm. Because the other two times, the American Chemistry Council had poured so much money into it that, um, that they didn't, the votes didn't happen. This time, it looked like there was going to be some courage, and it was going to happen. And it did. And then Governor Brown signed it on September 30th. We were like, yay, we're done. Finally, it's going to happen all over the state. You know, because there's Beacon members like Oxnard, which uses the most bags of any city in the, you know, Beacon members, and we weren't going to get Oxnard. So it's like, okay, this is, this is the way to go. This is great. And then um, the American Chemistry Council paid for a referendum. And so referendum, they, they hit the streets and paid up to $3.50 a signature and got the number of signatures needed to put it on the ballot. It was supposed to take effect July 1 of this year. And so the, basically, by spending about $3 million on the referendum, the uh, plastics industry bought themselves 18 more months of use of plastic bags in all the places in California that were going to be shut down starting July 1st. And now it's on the ballot September or November of 2016. So we're back at it because we're, we're you know, now saying, well, forget it. And the city of Sacramento just passed their own law last week, kind of as a little nose thumbing to the state. Um, and said, and there, there is now a new clause, so the law has been kind of modified again, that says um, subject to state passage of SB 270. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll let their law go in place of what, what the state does, but their law is in place and will get started soon. So, yeah, we're back at it. And, you know, hindsight being 2020, that probably is what should have happened before, because we saw it before, we saw that at the last minute, you know, the, that we thought was a bill was going to pass statewide didn't pass. Um, in this case, it was even signed by the governor, but, you know, obviously not implemented. Uh, our city ordinance actually says if there's a 
stronger state ordinance, then we will, you know, comply with that. But uh, the the state bill that passed was identical, if not, you know, closely similar to what we had. But I think, you know, I think, you know, had you look back and and again, I go back to political will. I think it's a good question to ask. It's easier just to say, look, statewide's good. We're not to deal with it because. You, you, there is opposition, whether you agree with it or not. And so some people are feeling like, oh, this is, you know, that for whatever reason, they don't feel like this is something that um, is meaningful for them in their, in their values as an elected or whatever it is. It's easier just to step back and say, we'll just let someone else take care of it. And that sounds very cynical, but in some cases, I think that probably was the case, not in everyone's case on the elected side. Um, but I think it's worth, it's worth asking. And I think, you know, if Kathy and the coalition are going to come back saying, hey, we got, 18 months here, let's just do this. You have the EIR, you have everything you need, just say yes, just say I. And we're, you know, we can, and, and if, the, if the law passes statewide, well, that's a good thing. If it doesn't, then at least you're covered here, you know, but why are we waiting now another 18 months or more? Yeah, there's a, there's a renewed push on, on the entire state, and San Diego looks like it might be about to pass, which would be great, because that's the, the last big city in California that doesn't have a law. But the, you know, the industry is really scared of California because there's a saying that as California goes, so goes the nation, and that really scares them. They want to keep this business model going. Um, so they've thrown everything they can at the state of California because they don't want to see this happen here. Um, and our neighbor, Arizona, I don't know if you saw this, Arizona's legislature just this week passed a law banning plastic bag bans. The governor hasn't signed it yet. I don't know what that governor's politics are, but I'm assuming if the governor signs it. And, this, and, and I heard that the legislation has, was written by the lobbyists for the American Chemistry Council. They're, they're trying to cut it off at the knees. And these are the same people that voting for this that said, oh, nanny state government, you can't tell us what to do. And now they're cutting off their municipalities from, you know, municipalities are in charge of solid waste, right? So they're now telling their municipalities how to, how to manage their, own, their solid waste. Kind of crazy. We have someone down here too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, sorry if this was covered already, but um, I was just wondering, and I'm not suggesting this is what we should do, but I was just wondering why we don't just charge for the plastic bags. I mean, as if I go to the grocery store and spend all this money on groceries, the last thing I want to do is spend like five cents on a bag. Oh, it's terrible. So, you know, I was just wondering why that isn't. The, the law is that you are charged 10 cents for a paper bag. Well, right, but and for a plastic bag. I'm there just why aren't any plastic bags. They're just not there. Yeah. Well, I, I, I know that's what you said, but I'm just wondering why that we don't just charge for that. Because, because the lobbyists got there that. first again. They yeah. beat us to it again. In 2006, there was, um, or 2005, I think. Remember when they first started having recycling bins for, for plastic bags at grocery stores? Um, that was a lot, and I'm forgetting the number of it, AB forget which one, um, and there was a clause in that law that said, and no fees shall be charged for plastic bags. That's right. So that's why this fee ban model came into play, because that was the only way to do it, because it was already preempted by state law to do it. Because you're right, charging, like Washington, D.C. and other, other places have set it up to charge, and they're getting the same results, which is a 90% reduction, but it's, it's fairer, because you can still buy a plastic bag if you want to. Um, which is to your point, but you can't, you know, we got cut off at the knees here in California. Yeah, I forgot that. about that point. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's complicated. We had someone down here, I know. The American Chemical Council is the big lobby group, right? So what did they say is officially their reason for opposing the ban? Is it strictly business? They just say this will cost jobs? Or do they say well, anything? The, no, well, actually, there's, there's every, this is why Kathy was my go-to person when I got these emails. I've seen emails from people connected to the lobbyist group that said, you're going to kill, you're going you're gonna to get, make your kids sick because the reusable bags have bacteria in it that you don't wash your bags and then you, you keep using it and then you're going to eat bacteria and get ill. And I think there might have been one case like somewhere that, I'm 
mean, that bag must have been really gross. So I, I don't, you know. It was in a bathroom where people were getting sick all day. Right. So, you know, they used that bag. And it, I've used that, well, we're in a drought. And how did the drought one even work? There was something about it was washing a, reusable a bags. A washing reusable bags. You know, it's not good <laughs> because we're in a drought. So let's use plastic bags. I mean, and then there was the jobs thing. And then there, you know, I mean, you just, just pick your pick your argument. So I, I would send it to Kathy. Well, here's a new one. You know. Yeah, and I was keeping track. This is, I just brought this for visual reference. This is my notebook just to 2010. <laughs> and then this was stuff subsequent to that that I didn't put into the notebook. And I've since I've kind of stopped printing things so out. But if I was your it professor, took a lot. <laughs> if I was your professor, I'd give you an A on the project <laughs> from City College. So. All right, please join me in thanking all of these folks. <laughs>